Some of you who have worked in deliverance for a while have a few people you work with that are highly resistant, not resistant in terms of their will, but whatever is around them attached to them just isn't moving, even though you have taken them through endless renunciations, they've had all kinds of prayer. I'd like to present a possibility to you here. This is not a cure-all, not the silver bullet for all difficult cases. It is another tool to put in your toolbox to use occasionally, sparingly, as God would direct. And that is the use of baptism as a deliverance tool. Let me have you walk through with me the pathway that I took to get here. This goes back many years when deliverance was done privately, undercover. It was not cool, and only crazy people worked in it. And in that episode, a friend of mine was doing deliverance for somebody who had come out of Satanism. And in the process of the deliverance, the guy died. Well, fortunately, on the deliverance team, there was a lady who was a nurse who worked in cardiac care, and she immediately went to work with a wet washcloth, slapping the fellow's face, calling him back, and he came back to life. Needless to say, my friend was a little bit shaken. The image of, you know, the fellow not coming back to life, and the police coming, and the coroner coming, and the press coming, and the trial for killing somebody in an exorcism. I mean, he has all these thoughts going through his mind. So he came to me. I don't know why he came to me. And he said, Arthur, what did I do wrong? I said, I have no idea. I have never had this particular experience in my life. Thank you, Lord. So I said, let's ask Father. And we asked him, what did my friend do wrong? Why did this fella die? And the answer that came back was almost irritated that we had asked. And God said, it was just taking too long. I just killed him in order to break a bunch of covenants and save you a lot of time. I brought him back to life. Everything's okay, right? And we said, easy for you to say, God. You know, I <laughs> and we wrestled with that for a while. God took us to the passage in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's around 729, that talks about the marriage. Marriage is a covenant, and the covenant is to remain unbroken until the death of one spouse. And when the, the man dies, the wife is free of that covenant, and she is permitted to remarry. And apparently, there are a lot of occult covenants that are also attached to a specific lifespan, and when God very calmly killed that fellow for a moment or two, it ended a bunch of those covenants, allowing him to come back to life as an individual without those covenants holding him. Well, that was certainly a novel view on deliverance at the time. We pondered it, even though it sounded wonderfully logical. Neither one of us was particularly excited about adding routine death into our repertoire for deliverance. I hope you aren't either. And while we struggled with this concept of clearly death is one of the most efficient ways to do deliverance, but it has these complicated downsides, God took us to the concept of baptism and pointed out that baptism was God's initial plan for deliverance. Let's look at it in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6 gives a very succinct picture of baptism showing the death, burial, and resurrection. Chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. There's other passages in Scripture referring to circumcision as a baptism and a death. The coming through the Red Sea as a form of baptism symbolizing death. Throughout Scripture, this imagery of baptism and death are associated. That going through the ceremony 
of baptizing, of identifying ourselves, first of all, with the death of Christ on the cross, then the finality of the burial, three days with a rock and a Roman seal and a guard, then the absolute triumph of being raised to newness of life, all of that is summed up as a potential deliverance picture. The more we pondered that, the more we looked at it, the more we researched it, the more data we found to support it. As a matter of fact, through the history of the church, a great number of different streams of the faith have used baptism consciously as a deliverance modality because as the individual is preparing for baptism, they overtly renounce and reject the works of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, the Lord of darkness, whatever language they used, and used baptism as a covenant forming event proclaiming their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. As I was preparing this today, I thought I would check real quickly to see if there was, were any examples of that readily available. I got on the web, I did a quick search, and was surprised at how relatively easy it was to pull up this information. This one is from the Orthodox Church. It is from St. Tikhon of Zadonsk, or however you appropriately pronounce it. And this was the form, the language that they use or used for baptism. The priest who was leading it would speak on behalf of the baptismal candidate. We then renounce Satan and all his evil works. Satan is a wicked, evil spirit. He was created good by God, but he and those of like mind with him apostatized from him. And so from light, they became dark. You'll find this theme of light and darkness in renunciations frequently. So from light they become dark, from good they become evil and wicked. His works are idolatry, pride, deceit, falsehood, flattery, guile, envy, malice, plunder, adultery, prodigality, and all uncleanliness, slander, blasphemy, and every sin, for he is the inventor of sin. He beguiled our ancestors in paradise and led them into sin and apostasy from God. We renounce this wicked spirit and all his evil works before baptism. Point two, we renounce every vanity, pride, and pomp of this world as one's called to and renewed for everlasting life. Point three, we promise to serve Christ, the Son of God, in faith and truth together with the Father and the Holy Spirit and to follow in his footsteps. Point four, thus we establish a covenant between God and us. We who have renounced Satan promise to serve God and be faithful to him. God accepts us in his supreme mercy and promises us an inheritance in everlasting life and the kingdom and washes us who are defiled by sin and the labor of baptism. Well, that's the Orthodox Church. Here's another version that was used by an Episcopal church. It is in the form of question and answer. So the question, do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in His grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey Him as your Lord? I do. And then there's the participation of the congregation as witnesses. How about the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church has long used this for their adult converts, According to the Roman ritual at present in use, three questions are to be addressed to the person to be baptized as follows. Dost thou renounce Satan and all his works and all his pomps? To each of these interrogations, the person or sponsor in his name replies, I do renounce. What I'm suggesting is that if you are dealing with a case of resistant bondage, if you have done all the things that have worked for other people 
and have not been able to get freedom, it is worth at least considering the act of baptism as an act of deliverance. One of the problems that we run into in deliverance with DID is the fact that we don't always have the core speaking. For somebody who comes out of ritual abuse and has been divided and programmed, very often there is one part that is trained to do the religious renunciation. This part is very pliable, very cooperative. It will trot to the front whenever it's time to do in deliverance. It will renounce everything, proclaim anything, claim anything. It is just completely willing to jump through any religious hoop, but it has been the designated meaningless confessor and the rest of the humanity of the individual is not involved. This is a rather persistent problem in working with DID as we try to get to the core person, as we get to the essence of the will, or ideally we access the human spirit and have the spirit engage. I don't have any history at all of working with divided people and seeing a measurable succession of changes through their going through baptism, but it would certainly be an idea to explore. I wonder what happens if the whole body is immersed as an act of the will. One of the reasons that this comes up so often in my mind is that the dark side likes to corrupt and pervert everything that God has established as a holy symbol. Therefore, in most experiences with SRA, there's going to be a perversion of Holy Communion. And in my limited experience and listening to other people talk and other individuals that lead deliverance continually, it is evident that a lot of people that have come through certain streams of SRA have experienced drowning experiences. In the process of ritual abuse, there has been an intentional drowning, often to the point of death, and then the person is brought back to life. I wonder whether the drowning was primarily to traumatize them or whether this drowning to death was an occult symbol of breaking a covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and establishing a covenant with the powers of darkness when the individual is raised to life again. I don't know. I'm not particularly well versed on all of the motives and purposes of the evildoers. I'm merely suggesting that historically, baptism for the general population, somebody coming out of the world into Christianity, baptism was the symbol of renouncing the old, dying to break the covenant, coming out of the water with a new covenant with a new Lord. If it worked in that context and has been widely used in the body of Christ for many centuries up until recently, then it is possible that this tool might be adaptable to those who have gone through SRA, particularly those that have been drowned, as, again, a tool for the whole being, a tool for that part that was formed out of the split that occurred in the drowning, I don't know what all the ramifications are. I'm merely proposing it as a tool. Now let me add one other consideration here, and this is subjective, but it counts for a lot in my mind. I have met individuals who came out of SRA who were um, conscious as a young child of their craving for baptism. They knew that baptism was important, even though they hadn't been taught. They were in some sort of a pseudo-Christian context. They had some exposure to Christianity. And as a young, young child, there was a craving, an urgency, a desperate desire for baptism. Many of these eventually were baptized. And almost invariably... There was a frustration, there was a grief, there was an awareness 
that this thing they craved so much, this thing they desired so intently, didn't take, didn't work. It, it didn't happen. You know, whatever they were reaching for, whatever they sensed with their spirit that was out there, didn't happen. Now, I'm wondering whether it would have been any different for them if they had added the extreme renunciation of the enemy, the works of the enemy, the pomp of the enemy, the kingdom of darkness, embraced the concept of death and proclaimed in the act of baptism their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know. I'm putting it out there as a half-baked potato, putting it out there as a tool for those of you that work in deliverance to ponder, to consider, to see if possibly rebaptism might be in order in certain special circumstances.